up next, we are going to have a long way of Alexander Chinook, and he'll be presenting on uh, uh, sound therapy. And he has been a mentioned before, he's been a researcher for uh, upwards of 10 years, is an ethnomusicologist, and is leading the sound, um, sound and Music Institute at the Open Center, at which I am also participating as a student. And it's a really great program. So here we go. to listen to a bit is uh, based on years of training in music and uh, field work in over 40 countries and um, working with close to 9,000 people and collecting data from most of these people and from personal experiences. The approach that, that I took in studying uh, the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound um, is through three different perspectives. One, is the Western scientific, what we know about sound, from physics, physics, mathematics, neuroscience, music theory, philosophy, phenomenology to be specific, and so on. The second perspective is the uh, Eastern philosophical approach, um, understanding how sound's been used in Eastern philosophies, mantra, sutra systems, chants, and so on. And uh, the third perspective is the, the shamanic societal beliefs. Uh, why and how sound has been used in all shamanic society and what is its function really. And to better understand the complexity of this uh, field, uh, I took a multidisciplinary approach. So, uh, to start with, this is a famous quote by famous conductor Thomas, Sir Thomas Chen. The function of music is to realize, release us from the tyranny of conscious thought. We all love music. We don't know why we love music. We can all agree that uh, music is the most popular art, but it's really hard to understand what is it doing to us? Why are we heavily dependent on it? Uh, how does it affect us on a cellular level? And uh, so we're going to learn about a few things in this talk. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and, and you may interrupt me. Uh, there will be a lot of foreign concepts. Um, I have to say that um, I will go through all of them and, and, and explicate them and expand them as much as possible. But please keep in mind that I can spend at least half hour on almost every slide. So it's very, very complex material, but it's definitely material to be researched on your own. Hmm? or you can talk to me afterwards. So, here are some important definitions that I'll be using. I don't want to make the assumption that everybody knows these uh, words. Equanimous means enjoying a state of psychological stability and composure which is undisturbed by experience of or exposure to emotions, pain, or other phenomena that may cause others to lose the balance of their mind. In Hinduism, equanimity is just another term that attempts to describe the nature of Brahman. It is the state of absolute and unchanging reality. Equanimity is also mentioned in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra as one of the four sublime attitudes, along with loving kindness, compassion, and joy. This list is identical to the four immeasurables in Buddhist literature. Judicious, having, exercising, or characterized by good or discriminating judgment, wise, sensible, or well-advised. Ethos is a Greek word referring to the distinguishing character, spirit, personality, or sentiment of a mode, the underlying sentiment that informs the beliefs. This is a very, very important concept. If you're interested in music, I highly encourage you to fully explore it and understand what it entails and what its function is in music. I will go over it in a bit. First and most important, I'm going to explain what harmonic overtones are. Uh, an overtone is any frequency higher than the fundamental frequency of a sound. The fundamental and the overtones 
together are called partials. Harmonics are partials whose frequencies are integer multiples of the fundamental. These overlapping terms are variously used when discussing the acoustic behavior of musical instruments. When a resonant system, such as a blown pipe or a plucked string is excited, a number of overtones may be produced along with the fundamental tone. In simple cases, such as, the such as for most musical instruments, the frequencies of these tones are the same as or close to the harmonics. The human vocal tract is able to produce a highly variable structure of overtones called formants which define different vowels. Mathematicians call them the harmonic series, musicians call them overtone series, and physicists, acousticians, call them partials. So this is a very important concept. Basically, sound as we hear it is not just one note. If you're listening to a note, let's say, played on a violin or clarinet, you may hear it as one note. But it's actually composed from a variety of different frequencies that we call overtones. Um, think of an artist trying to paint the color of the sky at that particular moment in time. The artist is not gonna pick one color from the palette and just paint it. The artist is going to compose a variety of different colors onto the canvas. A little bit of white, a little bit of blue, orange maybe, some gray and red to eventually get you a, a color that is close to the color of the sky. So it's composed of different pigments. So sound is actually many different frequencies put together. However, most of the time we only hear it as one note. The reason is that's because the fundamental frequency is so present, it overshadows these other frequencies. However, if you were to analyze the sound doing harmonic spectrum analysis, which I'll show you some examples later on, you'll find there are many different harmonics present in it. We start to hear these harmonic overtones when we play instruments um, such as gongs, Himalayan singing bowls, discs, bells, uh, overtone singing as well, didgeridoo, juice harp, and so on. Coincidentally, these are the instruments that have been used and still are used by sound healers or sound practitioners. I wanted to understand why. Why do we gravitate toward these instruments? Why do we intuitively choose these instruments? And this is across all continents and cultures and different points in the past and the present. So, sound is a sum of different waves. When you pluck a string, it gives you the fundamental frequency, which is the string vibrating as a whole. But as it's vibrating as a whole, the string is also vibrating in division of two and division of three. Every time you break the string into different divisions, you are actually producing a different overtone. Hmm? So I'm gonna give you an example of, let's say this note uh, that I'm gonna sing, how it sounds like just a fundamental frequency, and I'm gonna do some diaphonic singing or overtone singing, sometimes called throat singing. Uh, there are various styles of, of diaphonic singing. I'm sure you've heard Buddhist monks, Tibetan Buddhist monks, or Tuvan, Mongolian, and so on. So this is a note. Okay, so now I'm gonna sing that fundamental frequency and I'm gonna um, play with the buccal cavity, the space inside my mouth, so that I produce different overtones by emphasizing uh, one specific overtone at a time while I'm still singing the fundamental frequency. How do I do this? I actually move my tongue back and forth to widen or close the buccal cavity so that that buccal cavity becomes resonant with that specific overtone and we get a natural amplification. And that's how overtone singing is done, basically. There are various ways of uh, producing the sound. It may sound guttural, you know, low in the throat or high pitched and so on, but it's, that's the basic concept. It's playing with the, the vocal tract. Hmm. So I presented you with all of the notes that are contained in this one note, but my voice. And remember that the function of overtone, uh, overtone series is to give any sound that we hear its tone color or timbre. And that's how we can um, differentiate my voice from someone else's voice or 
a note played on a violin from the same register note played on ukulele and so on. So it's very important to recognize things. Sound is not just about the note. The hearing um, is very complex, actually, our hearing, uh, because we have two parts. We have the cochlear, which is responsible for hearing sound, and the vestibular, which is connected to perceiving space. And the auditory system, auditory cortex, is one of the least understood senses. We know so little about how sound functions, how the brain perceives sounds. We know so much about uh, eyesight and, and the other senses, but very little about sound and hearing. So this is a harmonic series. This is the fundamental frequency, the string vibrating as a whole. If you were to break the string into division of two, you get right here a node. You probably have seen or heard musicians playing harmonics when, when they lightly touch the string of a guitar or violin or any string instrument. You get a light, eerie note. That's a harmonic. You're not actually stopping it by depressing it down, huh? but you're lightly touching it. If you break the string into division of two, you get an octave higher, eight notes apart, for those of you who are not familiar with music. So this C is eight notes higher than this one. And if you break the string into division of three, you get two nodes, one here and one there. And there would be the next harmonic, G, a fifth higher from this C, or an octave and a fifth higher from the fundamental frequency. And then if you break it into division of three, you get three nodes, and that would be a C. Now the string is vibrating in division of four, and right here, there would be a standing wave. That means the string is actually not vibrating. This energy that is going from here, meeting this portion, is neutralizing the note, and you get a node. It gets really deep into physics. I'm not going to go into there, but just please understand the basic concept, because we can talk about this for many hours. But it's a, it's a fascinating subject. And it goes on and on to infinity. Here we only have 16 partials. And notice that the intervals start to shrink. You'll see it more clearly in this here. Please ignore the music staff if you're not familiar with the music and music reading. You can just follow the notes right there. Notice that there's a big gap right here. This is the low C, and this is the octave higher C, the first harmonic. That's the fundamental frequency. So you have an octave, and then a fifth between this C and this G, and then a fourth, and the intervals start to shrink as we go higher and higher, and it goes on to infinity. So my voice, let's say, would have specific overtones, not all of them, specific ones, each found to different levels of strength or weakness. The combination of all of that would give you the tone color for any sound that you hear. But you may hear just one note, but it's actually composed, again, of many different frequencies. So now I'm going to play you a sound sample. And the sound sample is going to play you all of the harmonics up to the 16th. And please listen carefully and listen to, s you may perceive some notes to be out of tune. And we'll talk about this in a bit. Do we have audio? Let's try it once again from the beginning, please. Here we go. So these are the harmonics. Now, there's something that's called the equal temperament that <laughs> uh, we implemented uh, a few centuries ago, I mean, early talks started a few centuries ago, but became implemented later on, um, gave us some advantages, which is the ability to transpose a piece of music from one key to any other key. That means, let's say, um, if there's a singer and the singer is trying to sing a song and the song does not fit his or her register, so we move the tonal center to a different key taking it from the key of C major to the key of A major or E major and so on, just to make it more comfortable to sing. 
So that's what a transposition is, whether for a vocalist or for an instrumentalist. It's a, it's a common thing and it's very useful. Before the equal temperament, we couldn't play on a, let's say, um, harpsichord. This is during the time when equal temperament was um, invented. Uh, there was no pianos. If you were to tune the harpsichord, you can only play in certain keys. If you want to play in distant keys, not neighboring keys, you'd have to retune it. So why? Because the equal temperament was different, uh, became different than what came before that, which we call either Pythagorean tuning or just intonation and so on. There are many different tunings. The equal temperament came and quantized the 12 half steps. Most of you may know that the Western octave is divided into 12 half steps. A half step is the distance between a white key and the adjacent black key on a piano. C to C sharp, C sharp to D, and so on. Okay? I'm emphasizing this because in other cultures, the octave is equal to more than 12 half steps. For example, in Indian music, the octave is equal to 22 tones. In um, Arabic and Persian music, the, oct the octave is equal to 24 tones. In Turkish classical music, the octave is 53 tones. Very minute divisions. Now you might wonder why. We're going to talk about this in a, in a minute. So the equal temperament quantized, broke all 12 half steps into equidistant measurement. The advantages that it gave us is the ability to tune one instrument in just one tuning and being able to play in all keys. You don't have to retune it. All right? The detriment, which not a lot of people knew about, is that it separated us from the mathematics of sound. And sound is all mathematics. When you listen to sound and music, you're actually listening to mathematical ratios. They're, it's audible mathematics, if you will. Okay? So that's a very important concept. When this happens, music would impact us to a lesser degree. We stop vibrating sympathetically with music. As beautiful as Western music <coughs> is to all of us, whether it doesn't really matter what you're into, classical, jazz, pop, hip hop, death metal, and blues, um, it's not as impactful as it can be because the octave is quantized. Now, this is a system that ancient musical cultures continuing to exist did not adopt because you would lose the state of trance, the ecstatic states, the states of euphoria, of ecstasy that one can achieve through attentive judicious listening. Nonetheless, people still experience the profound uh, effects from Western music, any style, especially if they're dancing. Yes, but it can be a lot greater. Okay? So, now I'm going to go into another level of complexity. <laughs> Not yet. So this is once again the harmonic series. And C, fundamental frequency, and overtones. Here we go to the 20th partial. Now you notice that there are fluctuating integer numbers uh, on top. And notice that all of them fluctuate except for the fundamental frequency. And every time the fundamental frequency repeats in that series, all the Cs basically. All other notes fluctuate. What are these integer numbers? These integer numbers are actually the fluctuation of the tuning of the harmonic overtones if you were to compare them to an equal tempered keyboard, piano. And the half step, well, let's start with the octave. Acousticians, physicists who study sound and, and sound uh, behavior, um, divide the octave into 1,200 cents. A cent is a unit for logarithmic measurement, which makes every half step 100 cents. So in equal temperament, you have each half step equal to 100 cents, when in fact, not all of them should be equal to the same number. Some may be 98 cents, some 104, some 106, and, and so on. The total would still be 1,200 cents, but the divisions are not equidistant. This will tell you how much each harmonic would fluctuate. So this G right here would be plus 2 cents. Well, one might think that if a half step is equal to 100 cents, what is, what is plus 2 cents? It's not that much, right? Yeah, you might not hear it, but your body is going to feel it. 
But it's not always just plus 2 cents. Some of them fluctuate minus 14. This is minus 31. Now, we've all he heard of the blue note, right? Blue note is note played flattened on purpose, especially in singing or we bend the note on the guitar or with instrument that would allow you to bend the note, move it up or down. So the blue note touches us, it, it, even though it's out of tune, but it, it makes us vibrate sympathetically. It affects us emotionally. Why? Because we intuitively feel this harmonic series. It's as if this harmonic series is encoded in all of us. This is where all scales, all modes, all harmonic systems, all inspirations for music come from. This is a topic that one can investigate for a lifetime. This is the stuff that Pythagoras was interested in, the father of geometry. Interested in the harmonics, interested in the connection between sound and sacred geometry, which is not woo-woo stuff if you start deeply looking into it. Hmm? And um, so this is where it comes from. Now, and keep in mind that blue note is not only found in North American music, blues, jazz, and, and pop and rock. Every country, every culture has blue notes, which are notes flattened on purpose. For some reason, we feel them intuitively and we use them. Now, in um, Turkish, Arabic, and Persian musics, you have half flats or half sharps. That means bring that note by quarter of a tone. Uh, this would fall between the black and white here on the piano. Where does this come from? Look at this, minus 49 cents. So we built systems, harmonic systems, that have been going on for centuries, if not longer. Okay? And we messed it up for ourselves. We quantize music, <laughs> like everything else we, we do. We adjust it based on, oh, you know, we don't like imperfection, let's just make it all equal. All right, so once again, this is how it's going to sound. ended on C. We don't have 20 partials here. I only put the first 16. Okay, so next very important topic I'm going to talk about, painting emotions with music. One way in which Western and non-Western musical culture differ involves the construction and use of scales and modes. A scale is any set of ascending and descending musical notes ordered by pitch and spanning an octave. The first note of the scale is called the tonic and it acts as a tonal center. Scales can employ different intervallic structures that change the overall sound. This is what we mean when we refer to a scale as major, minor, blues, pentatonic, and so on. Songs are composed around the use of any scale or combination of scales. Similar to a scale, a mode can also be perceived as a group of notes moving in a stepwise motion. Notes within modes, however, may be explored in various ways with different combinations and probabilities in a way that would bring out the mode's ethos. Ethos is a Greek word referring to the distinguishing character, personality, or sentiment of a mode. If we were to ask a performer of Western music to sing or play a specific scale, he or she uh, might do so in an ascending and descending stepwise motion. However, when we ask a musician from a non-Western culture to perform a specific mode, we would likely uh, receive an improvised melody or fragment that paints an atmosphere and mood. This distinction is important because the concept of mode involves how it elicits a particular emotional state. Modern music thus allows the listener to tap more into the spirit and sentiment that uh, contained in the music. This is less present in Western music with the exception of certain styles. Modes borrowed from Greek music began being used in the Middle Ages in church music, particularly in Gregorian chants. During the early Renaissance period, Western music departed from the use of modes, though it's resurfaced much later in some areas such as in modal uh, jazz, blues, and some rock. So this is what the ragas are about. If you're listening to Indian classical music and musicians are playing in this specific raga, the raga is all about the ethos. They call it bhava and rasa. Very, very complex form. I mean, the, the literature about this comes from 200 BC. Very extensive literature about the emotional content that's uh, in music. 
However, there is a prerequisite knowledge. As audience, you need to know how to listen. This is the other magic. And this is a very, very important concept that we kind of lost in the West. We don't listen to music the way other uh, cultures do. We don't just sit down and listen and watch the mind, have an awareness of the mind. Most of the time when we listen to music is when we are driving, jogging, cooking, cleaning the apartment, reading. Some people actually listen to music while they read. And doing things. All right, that may be pleasurable, but you have to realize that you're not getting everything. Your mind is busy focusing on something and you're hearing it in the background. That's not how we benefit the most out of music because the function of music is to dis disconnect us from the discursive thinking, from all thoughts. Basically, meditation. This is why I call my practice the practice that I put together, uh, sound meditation. Uh, Thomas Emilio also calls it sound meditation, which is wonderful. I don't find sound hearing to be accurate and fair. Sound hearing expresses passivity. The act of listening to these instruments, receiving the instrument, is, should be active. There is a responsibility on behalf of the receiver. This is not like Western medicine. Patient goes to the doctor complaining from certain ailment. The doctor examines the patient and then prescribes something here. This is, follow this and you'll be cured. These are medicines that we need to work with. We know this from many alternative medicine. So music is exactly, if, exactly functions in the same way where we need to make an effort. I'll go into this a little later, but I just wanted to emphasize the importance of the ethos because uh, healing in sound, I'm not saying that sound does not heal, it does heal, but one needs to have the awareness. But sound also reveals, if I were to call it something, I would call it sound revealing instead of sound healing. Sound healing sounds a bit too gimmicky, like many other things. Um, sound meditation is more appropriate because the person is doing something, is meditating while listening to it. Because the function of sound is to evoke emotions. This is where healing is, and that's something that affects the vagus nerve, autonomic nervous system, and I'll go into this later. So meditation, well, you'll all be surprised when you read the details of how much this includes. So, the etymology of the word meditation is derived from the Latin meditatio, from the verb meditari, which means to think, to ponder, or to contemplate. Meditation is a practice meant to bring a level of awareness to the nature of the mind and the mind's activities. During meditation, an individual trains the mind to concentrate on a single point, whether an object, the breath, a mantra, etc., in order to ease mental activity and induce a state of well-being. It has been practiced since antiquity and has been a component of many religious traditions and spiritual philosophies as well as in holistic practices. Another focus of, of meditation may involve delving into a particular emotional state such as fear, anger, shame, self-pity, etc. in order to analyze and understand that state and to learn to disconnect from it on the root level. The objective here is to disengage from one's tendency to generate such state and to break undesirable habitual patterns of the mind. The ultimate goal of meditation is to be attentive to the sensory experience rather than to one's thoughts on the sensory experience. Directing awareness inwards, resulting in what meditators describe as being awake inside without being aware of anything except awareness itself. This is basically what happens in sound meditation. Contrary to common belief, the practice of meditation is not to empty the mind, but rather to refrain from becoming engrossed in discursive thoughts that enter our consciousness and to train ourselves to do this in a non-meditative state as well. A constant barrage of random thoughts can cause mental fatigue by overrunning the mind. This eventually begins to distract and disconnect us from our environment making us more prone to misinterpreting and misjudging situations, projecting past experiences onto the present and unnecessarily expending metabolic energy. This fatigue can also make the mind less sensitive to what the body is experiencing in the present. Through self-regulating the mind, meditation offers numerous benefits on the mental, emotional and physical levels, quieting and clearing the mind, developing compassion, patience, love, kindness, generosity and forgiveness and easing health issues such as high blood pressure, anxiety, and depression. This is how we can use sound in an effective way, quieting the mind. But sound is a tool to fix our awareness on and just to observe, to listen attentively, 
judiciously, equanimously, but not have any thoughts on these instruments when they're being played. Beyond the meditation, the benefit of the meditation, sound does something to us. It quiets the brainwave cycles, which I'll show you later, the electric activity. Um, it impacts the vagus nerve. That's something my team and I have been working on, measuring sound's impact on the vagus nerve, the autonomic nervous system, on heart rate variability. That's how the heart communicates to the brain how the person is feeling emotionally and resets things. And also tapping into the ethos that's in the sound. Uh, another way of explaining ethos, this maybe it would be easier for people to understand, is that if you're listening to a piece of music written in a major scale, that piece of music is going to sound happy, lighthearted, easygoing. Hmm? Whereas a minor scale might make it sound um, sad, romantic, or it has a sense of lament and nostalgia, or spooky to some. That's an ethos. Most pieces of music in Western music are composed either major or minor. Rarely they, they're using, they use minor, I mean, um, pentatonic scales or a blue scale and other scales that are much less used. But predominantly, music is written either in major or minor. So harmonic spectrum analysis. Here I'm going to show you some uh, harmonic spectrums. First, we're going to look at what a Himalayan singing bowl sound looks like. First, you're going to hear the actual sound. And here you have two channels, left channel and right channel. So first, you'll hear the entire sound going. And then you start to hear each harmonic. And the harmonics are basically these horizontal lines. So if it's a thick, uh, bold line, it's very pronounced, it's very audible. And the fainter it goes, the less audible it becomes. So you will hear the entire thing, and then you hear individual harmonics, and at the end, you will hear all once again. technology allows us now to really investigate sound, what sound is composed of. So naturally, these higher harmonics are going to be overshadowed because of the masking process of the louder ones. When people hear it, generally they hear two or three harmonics. But if you're meditating, if you're sitting with eyes closed, and you listen to the sound that that ball playing again and again, when your mind quiets down, you start to become aware of things that were there, but you didn't notice them. This is how consciousness expands, by becoming aware of subtle things when they have been there all the time, but we don't notice them. Why? Because our mind is in the way. We're too busy. There's too many things happening. So this is what meditation using sound would clearly audible harmonic overtones can allow you to achieve. And um, I will show you some other examples. Um, probably most of you know the Shruti box, which is a squeeze box that has reed in it. It's kind of like a small, basic, modified version of the harmonium. Uh, vocalists often uh, use it for toning and vocalization. Huh? So this is one note on the Shruti box. And look how many harmonics it has. Of course, people don't hear all of these harmonics. They may hear the note, the fundamental frequency, an octave higher, and maybe in a fifth, and maybe this other harmonic, which is another C, two octaves higher from the fundamental frequency. Rarely people hear all of these things. But if you don't hear them, it does not mean that your body does not perceive them. We also, there have been many scientific studies on the body perceiving sound. But we actually don't realize that. Why? Because the auditory aspect is far more pronounced than what the body perceives. So we think that we experience sound just with our ears. No, 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 no. The body perceives it. I'm sure you've heard of uh, uh, deaf people who play sound and tell you we feel it. Evelyn Glennie is one of them. She's a world-known percussionist. Uh, she plays as a soloist with various orchestras. She plays many instruments that deal with uh, 
percussion, but also deal with notes, like for example, marimba and vibraphone, uh, um, instruments with toes. Huh? And she tells you she feels it with her body, with her feet. She often plays barefoot to f get the maximum out of the vibration. How do they do it? Well, they can't hear anything. The body perceives that. That's something that we're not aware of. But if you want to be aware of it, when a gong is playing or a bowl is playing, just come and put your hand close to it and you feel the air pressure. Because as the membrane is vibrating, the molecules inside the gong or the bowls are being excited. Because of this excitement, they start to excite the air molecules around, which start to pulsate and push the air wave, which continues to go to your ear. And that's how we perceive it in Hertz. Hertz is cycles per second. That means it's based on how many pulsation. And we're limited with, with the way we hear things. We hear as low as 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. Uh, it doesn't mean that sound beyond and under doesn't exist. Leave it to dogs and cats and elephants. Um, so we, the fact that we hear this wave that means is getting to us, except by the time it gets to us, if the instrument is at the end of the, corner, uh, the, the room, that means we're just hearing it, but we're not physically feeling the pressure. However, our body is picking it up. But that's an aspect of how uh, sound travels, and it's just a matter of proximity so that you'll be able to feel it. Um, that's the sound of shrieky dogs. So this is a 38-inch symphonic gong. Um, there's too much light, one cannot see all the detail, but basically all of these lines all the way up, they go high and they're very faint. They're all harmonics. This is why gongs are used in sound practice, sound therapy, sound healing, sound meditation, whatever you want to call it. This is the sound of a didgeridoo. All of these lines, and these are breaks basically stopping the playing just to to show breaks there. Very pronounced harmonic spectrum. This is Native American Indian flute with trills and descending notes and ascending. Huh? A lot of harmonics. This is a classical transverse flute, just few harmonics. You wonder why the flute is not used in sound healing. Doesn't mean that it's not beautiful, it's used, yes, but it's not going to impact the body in, in, in a powerful way like other instruments. Now you can use it, but still use the ethos, the emotional state playing modally, you know, it can be impactful, right? You see how we gravitate intuitively. We don't know anything about physics over, you know, but we still gravitate toward these things. This is the inner knowledge that we have within all of us that we need to seek. And this is what we're doing in these days. And meditation helps tremendously with that, but information should lead us to Wisdom and wisdom should lead us to insight. If we just stop at information, we don't get wisdom. We'd, we're unable to sift out the good information from the bad and what's useful. But eventually, we want to get to the inner teacher, the inner healer within all of us. So this is my air conditioner. A <laughs> uh, few harmonic overtones, but a lot of noise. This is called noise. White noise, pink noise looks like this. Anything has overtones. Your coffee maker, your vacuum cleaner definitely has overtones. Your car engine, all cars, okay, all engines and motors have overtones. Except it's a matter of whether it's really signal. Signal means overtones, and noise means just this washed out stuff that you cannot differentiate individual harmonics. Hmm? So now we get to some brain stuff, brainwave cycles. Uh, most of you probably know that we have five brainwave cycles or five gears, if you will. Uh, the delta state is when the brain is working on somewhere between 0 0.1 and 4 hertz. That's deeply asleep, and, but not dreaming. Hmm? When we dream, we go into other states. The theta state is 4 to 8 hertz, meditative, drowsy, and drifting down into sleep and dreams. Alpha state, 8 to 13 hertz, awake but mentally relaxed. Beta, 12 to 
12 to 30 hertz alert, busy, concentrating, and engaged in activities. This causes a lot of fatigue. Most people in New York during the week are in this state. This is why they're exhausted at the end of the day. The gamma state is 30 to 100. This state we knew about it uh, just not so long ago. First, we didn't know it existed. Um, hyper brain activity, which is great for learning and creating. So here I'm going to show you some snapshots of uh, EEG studies that I've done, um, measuring how much sound can impact the brain activities. So this is my baseline's brain. Um, this is the left hemisphere, and this is the right hemisphere. This is time, which is about six seconds. The activities start right here, and they move and they go uh, toward the back. It's three-dimensional. The hertz are on the bottom, 20 hertz, 60 hertz, and so on. You can zoom in and out. The blue is no electrical activity, and the green is a little higher electrical activity, and then red, yellow, and white. The highest peaks are the white. And you can measure these um, uh, electrical activities using microvolts. This is what you see here, 0 microvolt, 10 microvolt, 20. And a microvolt is approximately one millionth of a volt. So it's very, very tiny charge. OK? So this is my subject's baseline. She's laying down, eyes closed, wearing a mask, not listening to anything. This is how busy her mind is. A lot of activity. It's a, quite a busy mind. So I played gong for a large gong for two minutes, and this is what happens. That's a quiet mind. Whether she wants it or not, her brain activity is diminished tremendously. Now, it's better if the individual is actually listening, giving awareness, doing something to stay there. Of course, she can fight it, and she can still pursue these discursive and tangent thoughts. But the sound is going to steal her awareness. It's going to exert its gravity onto her. All right? But when one works with this instrument, this is what you get, flat lines. Just a little eruption, a little activity right here. So these are various instruments. The fifth, the interval between C and G, or D and A, and so on, is known to be the most powerful interval. Why? Because it's one of the first intervals that occur in the series, the harmonic series. It's also powerful. So this, oops, sorry. Uh, this is basically. Uh, uh, just a little bit of mental activities right here in the left hemisphere more than the right hemisphere. And this is a small Japanese bell that I, that I have. It has very high range frequencies beyond 20 kilohertz, but the body perceives them. It goes up to 23 kilohertz, actually. Now, what? Pardon? Is that an Inken? Inken? Yeah, the stick with the little... No. Uh-uh, not that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. I, I use that one as well. Mm -hmm. So this is loud dynamics. This is soft dynamic, the same bell. Now you might think, wow, what is this eruption here? Is she thinking a lot? Is it producing thinking? No, that's not thinking. This is the limbic system. Limbic system is connected to our emotion. This is to show you how sound can move our emotions. So this here in the lower brainwave cycle, whenever you have this eruption undulating, not peaks, huh, this would be connected to emotions. So this is what is hitting in sound and music when we listen to, if you're listening to Indian ragas, if you know how to listen. For example, a lot of you have heard of the ikaros, the ayahuasca songs, huh? vocal songs sometimes accompanied with instruments. The Ikaro concept is all about the ethos. That's the whole point, is that in that state, when the person is subjected to, to the medicine, you know, DMT is flowing in the body and it's causing a change of tuning of, of the brain and the heart and many other organs. And it's not just the brain. Sound does magic, but the person needs to be listening. So healing comes from within. This is something I can talk about for a long, long time but really how sound heals through psychedelic plants, through plant teachers, and how shamans have constructed the practice. But of course, they talk about it in a different way. Why? Because when we don't know exactly scientifically what's happening, we confabulate something, we conjure up some explanation, 
And that's why it's very important not to take things literally that we hear around, but try to figure out what do they mean by when they talk about these things. And this is why if you're into shamanism, you realize that different uh, tribes have different cosmology of spirits, different ways of uh, making the brew, different etiquette of uh, uh, doing a, an experience. I've done a lot of field work with shamanic societies in, in many continents, not just Amazonian Indian shamanism. But take Amazon Indian shamanism, you know, if you focus on the Shipibo, the Shipibo would have a completely different cosmology than the Ashaninka and the Sequoia and uh, uh, other, other, including the Hopi Indians and, and, and so on. So um, these are models. Doesn't mean that, oh, we have to take this and make it our philosophy and just adopt it and work with it. No, it doesn't work for us. But we need to understand from the ancients what they have done, what they have been doing. And we are intuitive beings. Just give us time. We can find our way as if there's a compass within us that leads us to the truth. And with endeavor, with intention, we get there. Uh, unless someone interferes, misguiding us, or changing things, or distracting us, creating distraction, launching us in different directions. So this is what a frame drum does. That's another topic here that I can spend so much time is when you introduce rhythms, what happens, mm. entrainment and so on. It's very, very compl complicated. But one thing that happens is this synchrony that you have in both uh, left and right hemisphere. Yes, it's true, not everything is flattened, but this is still beneficial, this entrainment. So this is what a chacapa, that um, uh, the, the dry um, leaves, a bunch of dry leaves that shamans use in the Amazon tapping on the body. Huh? There you get a sound, you get also the tactile effect and the olfactory as well. So three things are working. And look at the emotions. This is where the grounding effect comes. And shamans often use it when the person is going through something intense in an ayahuasca experience. And um, to ground the person, to involve the senses, to activate the limbic system, all right? This is what Palo Santo does, off the charts, literally. Palo Santo is sacred wood, literally, uh, and it's a, it's a beautifully aromatic wood that's often used in shamanism, specifically in um, uh, Amazonian shamanism. <coughs> but not only Palo Santo, you can use neroli water or orange blossom water, it can still activate um, the limbic system. So, um, commonly used instruments in sound therapy, gongs, various traditions, types and diameter, the voice, singing bowls, Himalayan and crystal, bells, metallic discs, chimes, various types, reed instruments, shruti box, harmonium, so on, didgeridoo, tuning forks, frame drums, shakers, rattles, and other instruments played made from plant material. It's important to note here that harmonics can be produced on instruments even though they're made with plant material. In my fieldwork in Sub-Saharan Africa, I've, I've seen a lot of instruments not made out of metal. It's easier to get overtones, clearly audible overtones, if we use gongs, if we use an alloy to construct um, an instrument like a bowl, gong, disc, bell, and so on. But uh, Amazon India, I mean, um, uh, people, tribes in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, have actually constructed instruments from plant material, but still found a way to produce overtones. That's how much we rely on overtones. That does something to us. And, and interestingly enough, when they play instruments such as the jil, which is a mallet instrument that looks like a, a basic uh, uh, xylophone or marimba with amplifying gourds underneath, it's spelled G Y I. G-Y-I-L from Ghana, or the balafon from Mali. When they play these instruments, or the mbira, the thumb piano-like instrument, they tell you we're calling the ancestors, we're calling the spirits. Well, I hear overtones, and I know what overtones do to human beings. They launch us into an altered state, into a transcendental state. So you see how the rhetoric changes. Uh, you know, so there's another way to understand what, what we mean by doing comparative study. That's a much better way to understand ancient practices, but not to take things literally, not to take them out of context. And that's something 
as Westerners, we do all the time, even when we have good intention, but the magic is lost when we take something out of context. If you're an anthropologist or an ethnomusicologist or someone who has done a lot of work studying other cultures, you know about the value of studying things in context. We take them out of context and we standardize them here. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's very detrimental because this is how dogmas start and, and, and conjured up philosophies. So it's very important to be a little more judicious and att attentive to what we do in respect to these ancient societies. All right, so rain stick, tanpura, which is the instrument that's played in Indian classical music, giving also buzzing, a lot of overtones. It's a simple instrument, upright uh, string instrument, four strings that you play, just plucking four open strings. And it's usually the student that plays accompanying a vocalist or instrumentalist. But the value of it is that it gives a buzzing. Why? Because, well, you know, strings have a bridge on which they rest, but they insert a little thread to make the string rattle against the flat, wide bridge. This rattling caused the buzzing. This is the most important instrument in any Indian performance because it gives the harmonic series. And instrumentalist or the vocalist would need to listen to all of these notes to tune their intonation. Why? Because Indian classical music is all played on just intonation, which means natural intonation, the intonation that's found in the harmonic series, not in the equal tempered castrated octave. Hmm? So the vagus nerve you heard about earlier, this is the uh, most important nerve in the body, vagus uh, in Latin means the meandering, the wandering, because it goes around. So. This is also affected by, for example, I was talking earlier about ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, the beta carbolines in the ayahuasca vine that make the absorption of the DMT possible in the body, uh, affect the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve start to contract and, and in, in the, while it's being reset. And this is what causes the nausea and the purge and the, and the queasiness. So in that model, they tell you, well, grandmother, euphemism for ayahuasca, the spirit knows what you need to purge, and this is how you know, you're purging, actually. Well, that's one way of talking about it. Another way is to really understand the pharmacogenetics here and, and the effects of uh, what these chemicals are doing. And, but it's also being affected by sound. So you see how healing happens from within, but when we don't understand things, we human beings do something all the time, we exteriorize the experience. We think that's coming from the outside. I think with the, with the evolution of consciousness and the expansion of consciousness, we need to realize how much of a value there is in no longer exteriorizing the experience to, for self-empowerment. It's fun to do it in the beginning, but from here onward, it's, we need to realize our role in the experience in, and to gain self-empowerment and not to attribute everything as being outside of us. Of course, there would still be a lot of esoteric things that we don't have explanation. And I'm not saying science has the answer for everything. I totally agree with Victor Hugo who said, science has the first answer on everything and the last answer on nothing. <laughs> yeah? But at least we can use science. But we can use many other tools to understand what's happening. Um, the autonomic nervous system is also uh, affected by sound. This is the on and off for many things. Uh, parasympathetic is constricting pupils, dilating pupils, sympathetic, stimulating sal uh, saliva production. Parasympathetic, sympathetic is in inhibiting saliva production and so on. Sound meditation. Uh, so basically knowing, having researched all these things and I've been interested in meditation, holistic practices from a young age. And um, I, uh, along with the, all the things that I researched, I felt that it's very important to share this with people. This is knowledge that very, very few people, if any, know about. And I've done 12 years of training at the university in music, never touched about any of these things. So I wanted to communicate uh, this to people while working in putting together an experience. And I kept on actually doing field work with people. I, I worked on close to thousand people and collected data from them because I wanted to understand what people are experiencing. 
And I want a direct experience. Direct experience is the most important thing in, in part of it. So, and I um, gained tremendous amount of very valuable data, and I still do, uh, close to 1,400 emails, the longest emails that I've ever received since the beginning of email, and really valuable to them. So basically, um, I put together this protocol that I call sound med meditation, which is based on many things, many aspects. Working with intention, attention, and will. I should emphasize this, that intention alone is not important. You need to reinforce it with attention to realize that you're no longer siding with your intention. And the will to bring things back to intention. Setting, meditation, breathing exercises, visualization, guided visualization, verbal guidance to bring awareness, toning and vocalization, working with overtone emitting instrument, and judicious and equanimous listening. I can talk for a long time on each category, but you get the idea. Um, and I share with people some techniques to keep their awareness on the sound. Um, I'll be giving uh, this afternoon sound meditation, three hour long sound meditation. If you're interested in experiencing it, it starts at 5.30 at Hari Yoga at 8.30. Judiciously listen to the overtones, become aware of the space between the overtones, explore the different register of these overtones, observe the varying uh, modulation, the wobble or the beat of these overtones. Notice their varying dynamics, visualize opening yourself to the sound and merge with it. Contemplate the shifting energy of the overall sound and of the overtone. Allow yourself to be completely engrossed in the sound to an extent where anything outside of that which you're observing would cease to exist. This is where you become the sound, you, you become the event, and there's no more an awareness of the observer. Going deep into the sound until you reach a time-stopping ecstasy. So you see that the individual, the receiver, has a role, a very important one. As practitioners, we don't heal people with sound. Sorry, we support them doing the healing, but people do their own healing. This is how these practices work. The sound itself is not the only thing that's responsible for the healing. It's what you can do with that tool. Okay? There are many issues involved, many pitfalls involved with these, using these powerful tools. Ego inflation is the first one. S spiritual materialism is another. Spiritual bypassing, messianic visions. You know, we're always capable of confabulating some and con conjuring up an explanation. We need to be very, very careful when we deal with these practices because self-empowerment is part of the healing, is the first thing in the healing. So, these are some of the benefits of uh, sound. I have to rush through this, I'm sorry. If you want to look into these in detail, please check out my website, soundmeditation.com. I have a lot of uh, very important information and videos and, and podcasts that I've done. Um, some of the benefits working with sound, you know, enhancing self-awareness, it facilitates connecting with the higher set, promotes self-observation and self-worth, and increases the state of personal resonance and so on. Um, what I also promote, something very important, is phenomenological approach and ontological study of an experience. Phenomenology and ontology are both branches in philosophy. Phenomenology is the study of the structures of experience and consciousness. It is primarily concerned with the systematic reflection on and study of the structures of consciousness and the phenomena that appears in acts of consciousness. These are some prominent phenomenologists. Ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being, becoming existence or reality, as well as the basic category of being and their relations. So this, these are things that are empowering to individuals. This is not material only for intellectuals. It's every person's right. And that's what I'm doing. I'm bringing scientific and academic knowledge to people because that's what we need. We need tools, tools to enhance the things that we do, we think that we're doing optimally, we actually many things can be improved. So what would you consider if you're using phenomenological approach? Well, ask questions. As you're in the experience and having a powerful experience with sound, where is this experience coming from? How is it unfolding? How can what I'm experiencing be used in a beneficial, positive, constructive, therapeutic, healing and revealing way? What am I learning about myself? Which side of myself is being revealed? Why and how? And, and so on and so forth. Again, this would be on my website. I have to wrap it up soon. And that's my wrapping up. Thank you.
Any questions you have or, or you can talk after this? Yes, please. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Many people have reported um, experiencing something from an old trauma, something that they pushed away, they couldn't deal with, they didn't know how to deal with it. Um, or they thought they've fully explored it and they've healed and the system brings it back up. This happens all the time. When your mind is disarmed, the conscious mind is in a meditative state, your body brings out all of these things. You know, we all know what we need to work on. You just need to get the mind out of the way. And sound influences you by uh, creating resonance, recalibration. Another thing that people often tell me that I feel recalibrated. I feel as if something snapped back into grid, reset, re-energized. So it's a way of shaking all of the stuff that is still lurking in the subconscious mind and bring it up to your awareness, showing you this still needs to be dealt with. But the value of working with sound is that, yeah, a person can go into a non-ordinary state of consciousness, but there's no trepidation, there's no bad trip. There's a great sense of safety working with sound. Great sense of safety and you remain equanimous and that this sense of timelessness, there's no judgment because we're <coughs> almost disconnected from the normal functions, from our guards. So that's how I've observed things happening with my clients. Other questions? Yes. Um, is there any information out there about if you are under ayahuasca or any other substances that you can hear different frequencies that Yes, you can. I mean, uh, no, I, I, I've never seen, but you can hear your auditory system becomes so, so heightened and that's part of the experience to a level where realities spring out of it. And actually, um, uh, I strongly believe that there's a connection between synesthesia and this visionary state. Synesthesia is the crossing of senses. One out of every 10 people is natural synesthete. That means they see colors when they hear music or sound. Um, or specific key signatures, pieces written in a particular key. Um, we all become synesthetes if we're doing ayahuasca or a plan like that. And this is where it emerges, except there it become the, the, the visions, which are not just visuals. These are uh, visions, we're experiencing them also emotionally, energetically, psychically, spiritually. And um, uh, they, they come out of sound, the combination of sound and the medicine. And what they also do, uh, they become programmatic based on our intention, based on what our higher self, the awakened self, or whoever is involved, Eon Sophia. I think Eon Sophia is grandmother. <laughs> I'm not gonna stop talking about this because it take a long time. So um, we encounter what we need to encounter to uh, have a clearer idea of what we need to work on. But yeah, they work hand in hand, absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm often asked this question. My, uh, my answer is, I don't know. It can be, the, the question is basically, is 432 hertz the more correct standard frequency to tune instruments than 440 hertz? Possibly, but we need to do more scientific studies. Why? Because I can tell you as a musician, uh, frequency, the standard frequency has been fluctuating for centuries, going up and down all the time. If you're a musician who plays in, in uh, an orchestra that follows performance practice, performance authenticity, that means you try to perform the music of Bach in the most authentic way. This is lifelong study for a musician or a conductor or a scholar. You are likely to perform it or record it in 415 hertz, not 440, because this was the frequency back then. If the ancients knew about 432, then if we look into the past, we find 432 everywhere. But it's been going up and down throughout. So we need some more scientific studies. But I have to mention that there's a lot of disinformation, a lot of misinformation about sound, 
maybe more than any other field on the internet. So you have to be extremely careful because there's a lot of wishful thinking, wishful believing, hooey and hokey stuff, and um, unconfirmed rumors. So, so much to a nauseating level that's misleading so many people. Sometimes people out of, you know, being so passionate about something can start to transmit and believe in what is being circulated or following the majority, while probably everybody is wrong. So we shouldn't let our passion contribute to this misleading because we can still misinform people even though we are serious and passionate about something. So my answer is, I don't know. It's possible, but we need a lot of uh, tests to quantify this. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you.